Uh, we will be recording this. So if you don't want your face um, on the recording and that's, it's perfectly okay if you do, but many people are like, oh no, I don't want that. So just go ahead and um, um, turn your, um, your, your photo off. And so we can keep up with that. All right. Uh, again, Bonnie Rinks, Director of Field Education. Summer Wildeman is also here. And then Elizabeth Alexander, who is our grad assistant, is in as well. So just a little plug. So, um, mm. and we've done this a couple of times. Um, we do have, um, at the master's level, we do have an addictions certificate that um, is available for current students as well as individuals who are working in the field of addictions to come back and get the requirements that they might need to sit for the Indiana LCACA. So for more information, you can contact Dr. Jay Dickerson. His number is at the bottom of the screen. And then um, we just wanted to remind you of that. And then just to let you know, um, since COVID, we have had um, a lot of students, former students or uh, potential students ask about an online MSW program. We have been discussing this and uh, have decided to offer one beginning in, um, it's actually gonna launch in the fall of 24. Um, so stay tuned for that, some more information. We will not, uh, admission for that doesn't happen for a little bit. Um, but just to let you know that that will be beginning, it will be a clinical uh, MSW because that's what we do. And um, that's kind of, um, feel, we feel like that's what we do and what we do well. So again, Dr. Dickerson is who you contact for that. Um, so Summer, you wanna take this away, away for the survey? So we just wanna give you a heads up. Um, several of you may already know about this, but um, with Social Work being a free professional program, and of course, we're the educators locally of that program, we really want to make sure that what we're teaching in the classroom really is relevant to what you're doing out in the field. And so some of our instructors um, have really, um, you know, grabbed onto that and have um, adjusted some of their assignments. Um, because of that. So some of you may have gotten reached out to last year and helped us originally start this project out. Um, our first focus has been on assessment. And so I know, and thank you so much for those of you that have helped us with that, um, that you shared your assessment tools with us. And so that has been implemented now. And so we really wanna know, like, is that working or not? So if you had um, an intern or several interns last year, um, you may get a survey from us. It's kind of a pre-post-test kind of situation um, because the individuals last year that were interning would not have had this information, whereas the interns this year will. Um, it's a very short survey, 10 minutes at the most. And um, so if you get that, we would really appreciate if you fill it out for us to do with that connection between classroom and community. And um, we would just really appreciate your feedback. If you get it and have questions, though, definitely let us know, and we'll go from there. Thank you. You want to jump back in, Monica? Yeah. We keep going. Um, go ahead. I was just okay. I was talking, but I didn't. I didn't unmute myself. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so to get back on track now, um, so now that we're through all of our, you know, pitches and performances. So why are we here today? So. Really, we want, we started offering this training several years ago and we felt that it's been really helpful. We really want to make sure that everyone has very clear expectations. Um, this is such an important part of our students' educational journey, and we want to make sure we want to partner with you and make sure that you have all the information you need, that we have all the information that we need. Um, so really it's to really stress and clarify expectations. So the goal here is to help move students from students into professional social workers. And field really is the bridge between those two things. So just to kind of touch on our agenda for today, we're gonna to talk to you about how students get placed, who's who in each of those um, interactions, what their roles are. We also will need to touch on CSWE, our accrediting, our accrediting body, um, so that you know what competencies and behaviors they expect our students to have at graduation. Um, how their learning plans are constructed and what your role will be in those. 
what to do if any problems occur. Um, frequently asked questions. Um, we do have a few new things that we want you to be aware of. And of course, we'll have time for questions and comments. Hey, Summer. Yeah. Um, um, you're kind of muffled a little bit. Okay. Your, your mic is kind of muffled. Um, I'll take over because I know that sometimes mm -hmm. you'll, you can do some of that. So if you don't mind. Okay. Um, and thank you for letting us know that um, in the chat feature. If you you have any questions or if you don't understand or or you can't understand us, please let us know. We'll do our best to um, adjust that. And then also, um, if for whatever reason you miss something, we are recording. We'll post this on our website along with our um, um, PowerPoints. So um, just be aware of that. So, um, so during the field application process, students review, and we are using an age, um, a system called Tavera. Most of you are familiar with that now. Students review lists of agencies of USI um, agreements or agencies that we have agreements with. Um, then they kind of send us a wish list of a kind of ranking them one through five. Um, they're also asked for populations that they want to work with because sometimes students don't know the populations that agencies work with. And so if we have an idea of the populations, we can also help guide the students. Um, so just this is just an example of what this looks like. Uh, and if they put in a population and what kind of agencies might pop up for them. Uh, we also have um, the old fashioned way and we still have binders uh, with uh, lists of uh, our agencies and kind of what students have done. Agencies. So once we have the field education, the um, application for students, we have um, we authorize them to contact you. We, we don't want students to contact you without us knowing it. And of course, without you knowing that the student's going to be contacting you. So they receive a con an authorization for contact. And then they email you their resume and their cover letter um, asking for an interview. We want our students to interview just as if this is a job. Um, because some of our students, um, our BSW students in particular, might not have had that experience of interviewing for a professional position. And so we want that to be part of their learning process as, as well. And then once the inter student interviews, um, it's basically if this student is a good fit for you and also a good fit to the agency, a good fit for the student, then we can have um, a match. Um, and then we will send you forms to fill out in Tavera to finalize that, our field instructor guideline form. And then um, all of these, all of this information must be completed before students begin the semester. Um, you have received, some of you have received messages from Elizabeth Alexander, our student, um, our graduate student, our graduate assistant, um, about FIGS or field instructor guideline forms. We use the abbreviation oftentimes. So if you get that um, in Tavera, please fill that out so that we can have that on record because students do have to have that in place before they can begin their internship. Um, Summer, do you think your mic is working now? Let's hope so. So okay. um, if, if it cuts out, let me know. Um, you know, computers have a mind of their own sometimes. So um, at this point, if your student has not reached out to you, um, please reach out to them and or let us know um, because they do need to start wrapping their head around, well, what's my schedule and when do I need to be there and what's the dress code and where do I park and things like that. So if they have not reached out to you yet, if you'll let us know. So who's who? We've got the agency over here. So this is where the agency field instructor or supervisor is and there may also be a supervisor there. So this is where all of you land. Uh, of course, the students are in the middle here as the intern. And then um, over here is where USI is. So you'll have the faculty field liaison, which is also their seminar instructor. So that's kind of um, the link between the university and the student. And the so to talk a little bit about, you know, what the responsibilities are. Um, so with generalist, it's very broadly defined. Um, this is um, foundational field placement. It's designed so students can demonstrate those CSWE competencies at the generalist level. And some typical things that you'll see here are case management, advocacy, brokering, education, organization, um, group worker, individual counselor. And so any generalist student will need to be supervised by an LBSW, an LSW, or an LCSW. Then our clinical students, have uh, more than just those generalist requirements, they have clinical requirements on top of that. 
Um, so as Bonnie said, our MSW is a clinical uh, social work degree. And so they will fill, they will complete a clinical field practicum. Um, so this is those clinical students will be at, will have an agency based opportunity to do clinical social work. And of course, by the time they're done with their internship and getting ready to graduate, we would want them to be someone that you would want to work right alongside as a professional. So the focus here on the clinical is to provide opportunities for students to, again, demonstrate those CSWE competencies, but at that clinical level. Um, so this is advanced. It would reflect specialized knowledge, skills, and values of an advanced clinical social worker. Um, there's a lot of times with our clinical placements, there may be a mix of generalist and clinical, but that emphasis is definitely on those therapeutic skills and clinical skills. Now, all of our clinical students do have to be supervised by an LCSW. So what are the responsibilities here? So they um, need to reflect on the tasks of the week. They need to, I'm sorry, my um, screen is blocking here. Okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure I was on the right track. So um, you know how Zoom is, it blocks certain things on your, um, on your screen. So the students' roles, um, they are tasked with they need to be able to reflect on what they're doing, what they're participating in, um, explore any conflictual feelings. They need to have critical thinking skills. Um, they definitely need to focus on that learning plan and what those four competencies are and that they are behaving in a way that accomplishes those four competencies. Of course, they need to work within the NASW Code of Ethics. They need to be open to feedback. They are in learning mode, so they need to hear that and respond to that appropriately. Um, they need to have an, a mutually agreed upon schedule and stick to it, and they need to help facilitate that communication between all of the parties. So here are the extra people on our team. So these are our faculty field liaisons. So these are the individuals that you'll be interacting with the most. Um, so our generalist liaisons are here on the left and our clinical are on the right. So you will be working with one or more of these individuals throughout the semester and the academic year. So what is their role? So they actually conduct the seminar class and the seminar class is to connect and process that academic learning versus that practical field experience and drawing the line between the two. Um, they're responsible for helping with that personal growth of the student, those strengths and challenges. Um, they give feedback just as all of you will. Of course, those professional standards of social work and the code of ethics. They need to make sure that the student is meeting those core competencies and sticking to their learning plan. Um, they will meet with all of you as well as the student to do the midterm and the final to make sure that all of that is on track. And they will help with that communication between the agency and the student. So as far as all of you go, um, you are responsible um, for their educational experience in the field. So are they meeting those core competencies on their SLP? Are they utilizing and communicating with their task supervisor if one is involved? Um, you, of course, will meet with the student and the liaison at midterm and final as well and evaluate and sign those two forms. Um, you will actually be reviewing and signing their claim sheets as well, making sure they're them properly and fulfilling their obligation. And then the other really important piece that you will be fulfilling as the agency supervisor is providing that formal supervision. Now there's a requirement from CSSB that that's a minimum of one hour per week. Um, you can really structure this however you want, but we do encourage you what typically works best is if it is on a regular schedule. So if it's you know every Wednesday at one, we have supervision or something like that. Um, now they may need some things in between time as well, but making sure that you have at least one hour of really focused structured supervision per week. And the things that you'll do in that supervision is focus on that personal growth, strengths and challenges, just like the field instructor is doing, um, giving that constructive feedback and modeling and encouraging those professional and social work standards as well as the code of ethics. So again, you know, yes, you have that formal one hour a week, but of course, you know, these are students and they're learning. And so catching them in the middle of things um, may need to happen as well. And they may need check in time in between. 
So as far as the time sheets go, um, uh, Bonnie mentioned earlier to Vera, we have moved to this new system and it is um, it's been a learning curve for sure, um, but it is much cleaner and easier than keeping track of all the paperwork that we used to. Um, so they will go in, it looks similar to this. The student will go in, um, put the dates of the week in, and they will track not only how many hours they put in that week and on which days, but what activities they participated in. And then they will need a signature from you saying, yes, they did participate in those activities. The other thing that's on there is a, um, you'll see right here, supervision. That's where they would put in that one hour of supervision a week. So you are signing this to say, yes, they did their hours and yes, they did get their supervision this week. Now, if you're utilizing a task supervisor, the task supervisor can sign off on the hours, but whoever is their official supervisor with the proper credentials will need to sign off on that timesheet as well for the supervision. So just so you know, kind of how that works. So as far as the task instructor goes, um, this is optional, um, but sometimes what will happen is we'll have that supervisor that has those credentials and all that, but maybe there's someone else in the agency that really has a specialized skill set or an additional skill set, or maybe you don't have the availability for that student to be with you for the full 20 hours that week or whatever it happens to be. So this is someone in the agency that is well-skilled, you know, can lead the student well, that type of thing that they can shadow, that they can learn from, um, that can give them a different skill set or can help with those type of things. Um, so the task supervisor, you can have that individual, but that's also optional. So it kind of depends on your structure and how the agency is. All right, so as far as, C as CSWE goes, they are crediting bodies. So it's very important because they're the ones that say your program is legitimate, you know, graduates from your program who are going to be social workers. Um, so they dictate specific competencies that our students have to master before they graduate. And they are finishing that master in internship. So you're helping us monitor that and assuring that they get those activities and experiences. It has competencies built in. Okay, so you, you, uh, you froze, so I jumped okay. in. So I'll just take this for a little bit. Okay. okay. Um, so CSWE does have competencies that the stu students do have to master by the time they finish the program. And by finishing the program that is in uh, the end of April, first part of May, I, I think it, I can't remember the date exactly, but that's when they have to master the pro, master these competencies. Um, CSWE does a very good job of updating the competencies so they're relevant to the world today. And they just updated the competencies um, in um, 2022. So in July of 22, they updated those. We are using those new competencies. So if you have supervised for us in the past, then you'll see that the competencies um, are slightly different this this year so and we'll use those for a few years until they update those again so um so those are really important and we uh, want our students to master those competencies and cswe designates field as the signature pedagogy for social work education and so um, we do take this very seriously and i know you do as well and so we just appreciate so much that you take the time to make sure that our students when they graduate, they are ready to go into the field or into the social work profession as an entry level social worker. Um, think about training them to be your colleagues. So just really quickly, we wanna go through those competencies. Um, of course, demonstrating ethical and professional behavior, advancing human rights and social, racial, economic, and environmental justice, engage in anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion in their practice, um, engage in informed research and research-informed practice, engage in policy practice, engage with individuals, families, communities, groups, and organizations, assess individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities, and intervene with individuals, family, groups, organizations, and communities. And then finally, evaluate practice with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. And sometimes um, supervisors, especially if you're doing direct practice, um, you might not be involved in that um, assessment piece, 
Um, but um, someone in your in your organization is, and so that's why you fill out some of the forms you fill out. So helping students understand that it's not just doing uh, social work practice, but evaluating the practice and making sure that it's effective. Um, I do want uh, Summer to work on the student learning plan because Summer is one of our faculty liaisons and she teaches a seminar section. So she works with students on their student learning plan all the time. And so I do want her to take this piece. And then if you're muffled or whatever, I'll just jump in. And I apologize that technology is not my friend today. I don't know what the issue is, but yes, please still just interrupt me if you know I freeze or whatever happens. So. So as Bonnie um, stated, I am one of the um, seminar instructors for the BSW students for Generalist. Um, and so you, you may end up having to talk to me more often. Um, so the SLP is now in Tavera as well, just like the timesheets are. And basically what we do with the SLP is we turn those CSWE competencies into something that's measurable, so into an actual behavior. So the student will actually go in and so you'll see here like for example so you know here's competency one so then these red um, boxes here the student will actually go in and type in this is the behavior i'm going to engage in to master this competency so they will go in and fill that out they may ask you for feedback on that and you know maybe some help or some brainstorming examples um, and then once they've put all of that in you will sign off on it as well as the faculty field liaison to, to approve it. So when they are developing this SLP, it's really similar to doing a treatment plan or a case management plan with a client. You want to make these goals smart, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, relative, and timely. Um, so really, you know, help them think through that sometimes when they are um, asking you questions about so they will write in those specific behaviors. And like I said, they will, um, when they're done doing that and complete, with, that's usually within the first month of them starting, you'll sign off on it as well. So this is just to give you an example, turning those competencies into behaviors. So competency one is all about the FCO and professional behavior. And so, for example, you know, this is a SMART goal. You know, I will review the NASW Code of Ethics. Um, at the beginning of the summer, I will attend agency trainings. You know, you can measure that. You know what time it has to be done by. You know that type of thing. So that's just to give you an example. There, we talk about the SLP a lot in class before they fill it out. Um, but then also, like I said, they will very likely ask you for feedback as well. Like, does this make sense? Does this look right in this area? Or I'm really I can't think of an activity for this particular competency. Can you help me brainstorm that? Those types of things. And as the instructor, we go through and help them with that as well when they have questions. Um, it can be a very daunting document when they first open it because there's nine competencies and there's several behaviors under each competency, um, but we survive every semester and get through it. So, All right, so the SLP is what you're going to evaluate at midterm and final. And so that's a little bit down the road, but we wanted you guys to know what it looks like and how you rate it. So here's the rubric for that. It's a one through five scale. So at midterm, if for some reason the student maybe hasn't gotten to that task yet, or um, maybe it needs to be rewarded or something like that, you potentially would have an Um, One would be that this practice has not emerged yet. Um, two is that the practice is beginning to emerge. Three is that they are developing this behavior. Um, four is they are approaching consistency, and then five is that they consistently demonstrate it. So at midterm, if we have, you know, some one, twos, and threes, that's expected because if they're already at mastery at midterm, then, you know, why are they there for another semester or half a semester? So that's very common. Um, if you have any NAs at midterm, though, those cannot remain at final. And so if you have any of those at midterm, make sure that you address it. And you may need to either change that behavior, you know, maybe in August or September when you filled it out, you thought, oh, yeah, we're going to get to that. And maybe something changed. It's okay. It's a living, breathing document. We can always make changes to it. Um, or it might just be something, okay, yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. We know we're going to address that in November or something. 
totally fine. We just can't have any of those NAs at final. Um, the goal at final is to have all fours and fives, if at all possible, because again, at final, you know, they're getting ready to graduate. We want them to be able to walk into a job. So um, fours and fives are expected at final if they've earned them, of course. So the midterm is just a snapshot of their current progress. Sometimes students get really caught up in that one through five scale and comparing it to an ABCD scale. And so some of them panic if they have threes because they think that's a C, but that's okay. This is not a grading scale. It's really just a snapshot of accurately where they're at at the time. And we do try to reinforce that in the classroom and encourage all of you to reinforce it at the agency level as well. So this is just to kind of give you um, just a visual of what this looks like. Um, so the SLP on Tavera feeds into the midterm. And so when this pulls up at midterm right here where it says task, it would be whatever the student typed in. And then you would have this opportunity here to rate them. And there'll be instructions coming out about that later as well. Don't feel like you have to remember all of this now, um, but we just wanted you to see you know, what it looked like up front. So I jumped ahead of myself here, I apologize. So um, the, at the midterm, there are a few additional questions. So you will rate their SLP, but then, you know, as you know, with students, of course, they are working on those social work skills, but they're also working on those professionalism skills and workplace skills. So at midterm, there are a few extra questions that we have you answer as far as their professionalism and their behavior. So, you know, are they utilizing supervision properly? Are they coming to work on time? Are they following dress code? Things like that. It's really good feedback for our students and for us as an educational institution. And so those will be some extra questions that you'll see at midterm. And then we talked about the final. The final works the same way that the midterm does. All of those um, SLP competencies and behaviors dump into the midterm, you do those scores. And then when it comes to final time, all of those behaviors and those midterm scores dump into the final. And so you'll get to see across the board what that all looks like. And again, we do expect mastery at the end of that. So we hope those are fours and fives. Just a note here at the bottom that midterm and final, we do encourage all of you to schedule an hour for it. Um, many times though, especially the students doing well, it'll be about a 20 to 30 minute meeting. So we just wanna kind of have you a heads up so you know what to schedule for and what to know there. Um, most of those happen via Zoom. Um, you can do them face-to-face -face or over the phone as well. It depends on everyone's schedule and comfort level. And we'll let all of you discuss that with the students and the faculty field liaison. Just a note here about signatures. When you go into Tavera and um, when you get an email, it says, hey, you know, we need a signature. There's two ways that you can do it. If you click here, um, you can just sign it with your mouse. Um, I know me personally, that looks like a hot mess and I hate doing that. So I try to avoid that one. Um, Tavera also has the option that you can um, put in your password to sign it. Um, I usually do that. You know, it's, again, it's whatever your comfort level is. Um, we just wanted to point that out. So we have a couple supervisors um, when we were trialing Tavera last year, be like, oh, I didn't know that. So we just wanted to point that out to you um, during, during this time this year. All right, so um, one quick note about grades. So that is a concern for a lot of agency supervisors is, you know, I'm not an educator. I don't wanna be responsible for their grade. And you are not, and um, that is definitely the faculty's responsibility, but we do take your feedback into consideration. And so that feedback that you provide throughout the semester at the midterm, at the final is very valuable. Um, so we are responsible for that grade and they have other things they have to do as well. They have homework assignments and things that they do in class. So it's not just their performance and field. Um, but we just wanted to let you know that where that balance is, is that we are responsible for the grading, you are not, um, but that we do take feedback into that and it's very valuable to us and it is desired. All right, Bonnie, do you want to take over this part? Sure. Thank you. So um, we, we do our best. We, we work with students. We provide a lot of orientation to students. We provide a lot of feedback to students both uh, prior to field and then also in the seminar class. But there are times that problems occur. You know, prevention is best, but 
sometimes problems occur. So what we want to, to let you know is it's we are always here. The faculty liaison is here. If there's an issue, pick up the phone, send an email, uh, and notify us as quickly as possible so that the little problem doesn't turn into a big problem. Um, so it's kind of like um, at home, when everybody is on the same page, things run well. So if, there, if a problem occurs, whether it's coming in late or not dressing appropriately for um, the activities, for example, if you're working with children on a daily basis, you might not dress in a suit. But if you also go to court because of those children, you might need to dress in a suit. So just, if it's a little issue about that, you know, make sure that the student understands the expectation, meet with them, address those concerns, matter of factly, um, identify the problem early. Uh, most students, once they are aware that there's an issue, they will correct. And so that's why we want you to address it early. Um, and then you can just do a quick documentation, whether it's an email documentation or, or something like that, so that students have it verbally and but also in writing. Now, if the problem can sit, you know, can persist, um, make sure you notify the faculty liaison. Um, sometimes uh, you can set up a meeting between the faculty liaison, you and the student, and it doesn't have to be just at midterm at final. So if, you know, six weeks into the semester and you know you're going to have a midterm in a couple of weeks, but there's been an issue, you've addressed it, um, but you're still seeing some signs that the student isn't correcting it, then that's the time to contact you know, the faculty liaison or myself or Summer. Um, we will always loop the faculty liaison into that conversation, um, but just let us know, even if you have something coming up. So don't wait. Um, immediate concerns to address with the liaison are attendance, tardiness, tardiness issues, um, any kind of policy violations, uh, we want to make sure that also that they are following um, ethical guidelines in ESW um, um, ethics, as well as any particular um, guidelines or policies you have in your agency. Um, and if a student is resistant to feedback, please let us know, because that's one of the things we tell students that when they are receiving corrective feedback, and that's how we phrase it as corrective feedback, it's for them, their growth and their development. It's not because and we're trying to you know, shame them, but it's, it, how, it's how you learn. If you have that information, you can correct it. But if you don't get it, how can you correct it? So if they're resistant to feedback, we also need to know that because we can help facilitate that. Um, some things that might you know, you know, need to be uh, addressed are any kind of policy um, violations, whether it's record keeping, attendance, tardiness, uh, any kind of confidentiality. Um, I did have a situation a couple of years ago where a student was confused about um, electronic communication versus um, paper, literal pieces of paper communication. And so they, they were not sure about why, why confidentiality addre uh, was addressed with both. And so we talked about how things in the cloud are secure, many times they're encrypted, um, and files are paper and they can be lost very easily. So we had those conversations. Um, if the student is unable to cooperate in the learning process, we want we need to know that immediately. Um, if they're not meeting their learning expectations, and that's why we have a student learning plan, we also need to know that um, as well. So any kind of unethical conduct, whether it's physical or verbal, um, we need to know if they have violated any kind of drug or alcohol policy. Um, you know, our students are adults, and so they can certainly have a beer and pizza. But what they can't do is have a beer and pizza, then go back to your agency. So um, just pay it, you know, just be aware of those. Any kind of sexual misconduct or any kind of violation of the code of ethics. And then our field manual is on our uh, web web page. We have just updated that as well, and we'll send that link out to you um, when we get that published on our website. Now, our job is to turn our students into professionals. And um, that's kind of what you guys are. So, and it's really, like I said earlier, it's very heartwarming when we see our former students also taking on those leadership roles and supervising students that have come behind them. So turning students from students into professionals and leaders in our community, because let's face facts, all of us will one day give up the mantle to students coming on. And so we want to make sure that they are trained, they are competent in social work practice, they 
um, can be leaders in their community. And so we're turning them from party animals. And by the way, these are all IU students. These are not USI students. The ones on the right are the USI students. So turning from party animals to young professionals. Um, just some frequently asked questions. And if we don't cover these, um, please either unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you don't wanna do that, you can type it in the chat and there's three of us kind of watching the chat as well. Um, how many hours do the students need to complete? So this fall, if you're an undergraduate, if you have an undergraduate student, a BSW student, they need a minimum of 150 hours and that does go all semester. So if they reach 150 hours at Thanksgiving, they still have to continue go to go to your internship site those additional two weeks. We tell students to try to do, uh, excuse me, 10 to 12 hours per week. That will give them a little more than 150 hours. But if something happens and, you know, God forbid they have a car wreck or their mother becomes very ill and they have to be out of the internship for a period of time, it gives them a little bit of a cushion so they are not continually behind on hours because that that stresses students out and it stresses agencies out and it stresses us out. So we tell students to build in just a little bit of a cushion in the event something happens. It's kind of their insurance policy. Um, if you have a student next semester, an undergraduate student, they complete 300 hours a week, excuse me, a semester. And that, again, that cushion is 20 to 22 hours per week. Um, this one in the spring semester, that's the one that students tend to, undergraduate students tend to worry about the most. Um, they can do it. We have a very good track record with our students, but they do tend to be anxious about it at the beginning. Um, during the summer, um, our generalist MSW students, and those are students who do not have a BSW that have to complete a generalist internship before they go into their clinical year, they complete um, two, 425 hours and that averages out to 30 to 35 hours per week. Um, and then our clinical students are in the same agency, both fall and spring semester. They have to complete a total of 300 hours, and that's 20 to 22 hours per week. Now, if they are also working on the addiction certificate, there are additional hour requirements as well as a few other particular things for the addictions uh, certificate. Um, if you have any questions, we'll post this and you can you can have you can have all this information. So um, we share this important dates with our students. Um, we post it on their Blackboard page. You can also have it. The biggest question that comes up is when can I do my internship? Can I do my internship on the weekends? And the answer is if your agency is open, and, you, and the student has appropriate supervision, in other words, a social worker who supervises them, and they have appropriate activities to do on the weekend, then yes. Um, while we don't typically have classes on the weekend at USI, we are open. Um, the same is true of evenings. If students, if there's appropriate supervision and the tasks and activities are appropriate to their internship, then yes, they can do um, evening hours. Um, but what happens a lot of times is you, like every, you know, like most people in the world, don't have weekend hours or evening hours. So while the agency might be open, you might not be doing those social work tasks and activities. So that's where students sometimes get confused about when they can be at their internship. And then they cannot be at their internship. And this is a liability issue. We got this from risk management, not Bonnie and Summer deciding when they can do these things. But Students are covered by university liability insurance. And so the, kind of the rule of thumb is if the university is closed, for example, um, Thanksgiving break or Christmas break or whatever, then students cannot be in their internship. Um, there are times, however, that the, student, that the university is open, but there are no classes. Um, for example, um, uh, fall break, we are still working. We just don't have classes. Um, assessment day, uh, there are no classes, but we're still working. Um, so those kinds of things. So some, sometimes students get confused about that. So we try, we give this information to them and we can also share this with you as well. And then if you have questions, you can always ask us. 
So what if my intern does not complete all of his or her necessary um, hours? Um, they do have to complete the minimum number of hours to move on to the next um, um, internship. For example, a BSW student would have to complete a minimum of 150 hours and meet the competencies before they're eligible to start their spring internship. Now, we have had a couple of situations because life happens. Um, all of us remember COVID because that was a big, crazy period of life in which sometimes students didn't have quite the number of hours. And so we do have the option of giving an incomplete, but that incomplete has to be completed before they can begin the next internship. So um, the bottom line is contact your faculty liaison or me or Summer if that's a situation. Um, and then we can work with the student, work um, on a kind of a performance improvement plan. Um, and then, um, uh, we can help work with this. So let us know if it doesn't look like the student's going to finish. And then um, <clears throat> are the students allowed to attend any events um, or agencies outside of their internship? And the answer is yes, because they're students and they need to learn. For example, if we have a student who is inter interning at maybe one of the homeless agencies that serve the homeless population, there might be um, a, a big table meeting of all the homeless um, agencies that serve homeless. That's a great learning opportunity for students. Um, and so, yes, the students can attend those. Is there um, a, a training that would be very beneficial for a student to attend? The answer is yes, they can attend those trainings as well. Um, so, and we do encourage students to take advantage of those because again, they're students and they're learning. Um, what would not be appropriate for a student to do is if they're involved in like um, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, church activities, and they're, Boy, they're having a Boy Scout jamboree or the church is having a, um, I don't know, a training for Sunday school teachers or whatever, that's not directly related to social work although many social workers do these things. So those activities would not be appropriate for a student to take time away from their internship, attend those things and count those hours as part of their internship. So I hope, hope that helps. Um, so some are already alluded to this. Um, if you have an undergraduate student, then they can be supervised by a social worker who has um, a BSW and LBSW, LSW, or they can also be supervised by a clinical social worker. Uh, they need to have at least two years post BSW experience and at least one year in their current position or one year in that current agency. And then of course we have the field instructor credential form. Uh, we wanna make sure that anyone who is supervising our students that we know who they are and we know what their experience is. So we have a, so we have a form for that. And then our MSW uh, students that are doing their clinical internship must be supervised by an LCSW and someone who has been in their current position for a year. Now, I know some of you, um, you have interns, but you don't have a social worker in the agency. And that's why a few of our faculty have volunteered to do that social work supervision. Dr. Turner is one and Dr. Nguyen is another. And I don't know who else is here. I can't really see, there's several people up here. But several of our faculty have um, volunteered to be that social work supervisor and they bring that social work perspective during their supervision piece. In your agency, you will also you have people who supervise them because you know what your agency does. And so they will also receive supervision from you. And that's, we consider those who do not have a social work degree but are uh, training students, we consider those to be task supervisors. And then uh, Dr. Turner and Dr. Nguyen, Dr. Hahn, um, Professor Paulson, they are all providing that social work perspective. So um, hope that's not too confusing. Um, we do have, uh, we do train our students on safety precautions. Um, so they get that safety um, orientation as well. Um, if your agency doesn't have a particular um, orientation for safety, um, you're welcome to use ours. You know, it's on our website. And, and so you're welcome to use that and um, use that as well. Um, so students can hear it a number of places. 
some agencies do a really, really um, bang up job on safety orientation for interns and employees. And so sometimes students get that, get kind of a major dose of that. Um, we ask students to self screen if they are ready for internship, which means are they healthy? Are they in a, are they physically healthy enough to do an internship? Are they able to um, work in a safe in a safe manner? Uh, we do ask students to sign a waiver. And so it kind of addresses all of those things. Are you ready to do an internship? Because we want to provide our agencies with students who are in a physical and emotional place to be ready to do an internship. Um, so we, we do a lot of screen on the front end that before you guys even see our students. We have an emergency event guide that kind of guides students through the process of in the event of an emergency, what do we do? Um, again, we all just lived through COVID and we learned a lot from COVID. Um, you know, we had some things in place, but none of us anticipated the um, dynamic that COVID would, um, the shift uh, that COVID would cause us to do. So we're a lot more uh, prepared now than we used to be for those, those big emergencies. Um, and again, you can have this kind of information as well. So um, we'll post it on our website as well. So um, USI currently does not require our students to have uh, flu shots or COVID vaccinations, but we do encourage those. Um, it's subject to change depending on what the CDC says, um, but your agency may have those policies. So if your agency does, um, your student is required to follow the policy of the agency. Most agencies have some sort of a waiver in place for students who, or employees who, um, for whatever reason, cannot take vaccines. Um, students would fall under that same guideline. And then um, if your agency requires, you know, a TB test, drug screen, additional background checks, if your intern um, is ex if you're expecting your intern to do that, and those are requirements by your agency, then the student is also required to do that. So we'd like for the students to know those things ahead of time. And I, I think all of you are excellent about making sure the students do those things prior to beginning their internship. Um, we, ask, we have students do background checks as part of their um, application to field. They have access to that. So if you're requiring a background check, if you allow the student to give you that information, that's one thing that we do ahead of time. Um, drug screens we don't do because um, they're basically a point in time. And if we had them do a drug screen prior to going to prior to doing their um, application, uh, by the time they actually go into field, that drug screen is going to be you know null and void. So if you required those drug screens prior to um, um, they're starting, then I've lost, have I lost everything here? Oh, my screen just went blank. So I do apologize. Uh, we do have a question in the chat before I move on to this next slide. So, oh, sorry. Oh, twins, congratulations. So sorry about that. Um, that you take this, over one ear. Huh, no, I can do this, that's okay. fine. Um, so just uh, for someone who arrived late, this is being recorded and will be available to you. And also the slides will be available to you. And then if you have someone new in your agency that is going, for example, um, I got a notice from an agency um, that someone's gonna be going on maternity leave and someone else is gonna be taking over but they couldn't attend the training today. Um, that's one of the reasons why this training is available on our website, both the recording and the PowerPoint. And if you have someone who views this, um, not in this training, but on their own, they're still eligible for the CEUs, they just need to notify us. So kind of some things that are coming down the pike that you need to be aware of. And there's a movement afoot, it's called P4P, and it's called Pay for Placement. And this was a student-led movement starting at the University of Michigan um, three, four years ago. Um, students, specifically social work students, uh, there are no students. We learn, teach them to advocate and they start advocating for themselves. And they started a movement saying, you know, we're doing a lot of work. We should be paid something for our internships. So that, that's kind of what's coming down the pike. 
Um, and this is a national movement. So you'll probably start hearing about this and you'll probably hear students ask for if, if the internships are paid. Um, I know a lot of agencies have moved to some sort of a, a stipend or paid internship or grant or agency of employment or something um, to try to attract interns because interns are a great way to get future employees. So just be aware that this is going on and um, you know, you may, students may ask about it. Let's see. Um, we talked about this before, if you don't have a social worker um, on staff, you might have a social worker who serves on a board. Um, and we've had that situation where that social worker who's on the board volunteers to do the supervision. Uh, we also have faculty who have volunteered to supervise students, and we're really grateful. The cool thing about social workers is um, we try to help each other out. And so um, just because you don't have a social worker on staff doesn't mean you can't have an intern. Uh, we just have to go, we just have to, number one, know about it. Number two, find someone to um, do that supervision. And we can do that a couple of different ways. So uh, reach out to us. We're willing to um, work with you. And because there's a lot of agencies out there that do great work. Um, and it's also a great way to start getting in, uh, social workers in your agencies. So we can share whatever training materials with you and others, just ask us. Um, you do receive category two CEUs for this, I mean, excuse me, for supervising students. Um, here is, this is this is Indiana in, in ASW. So if you're in Illinois or Kentucky, it's a little bit different, but you can get CEUs, category two CEUs for providing supervision. Uh, of course, those of us who are licensed, you know, those CEUs are really come in handy. So um, you can get that for this. And if you need something from us uh, saying that you supervise someone, we're happy to provide that um, information. So you can put that in your portfolio or your file or whatever. Okay, fantastic. We have like five minutes left before uh, one o'clock. I know we've thrown a lot of information at you. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself, or if you want to raise your hand, that's fine, um, or type it in the chat feature. So if there's anything we haven't covered that you have a question about, please ask. While we're waiting to see if anyone has any questions, because or maybe Summer and I just did a great job, who knows, right? But to receive your CEUs, please email Rita Bruner. She's in our Outreach and Engagement Office. And her email, and we'll put this in the chat also, her email is rbruner at usi.edu. So once she receives your email, she will send you a short evaluation and that's required for CEUs. Um, and then once, you receive, once she, she receives that evaluation back, she will send you your CEUs. And again, these are category one CEUs. So um, make sure if you need that, you reach out to Rita. If you, for whatever reason, don't have Rita's phone uh, email address or forget it, um, let us know and we can connect you to her. Well, let's see, anything else? Summer, did we miss anything? Or is there anything we need to um, make sure that we hit home? Not that I can think of. The only thing that I will say, and, and you did touch on this, I just want to reiterate, um, we really, really appreciate the relationship that That's we have awesome. with our agencies and, and here in our community. Um, we think that we work really well together. We're very collaborative. Um, please know that we, we look at this partnership as a team and that we're all a part of that team to help that student successfully move into their career. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us, to communicate with us. If, you know, there's confusion about some sort of form or if you're like, you know, something's going on with this student, I'm just not really sure, you know, how to address it, whatever it happens to be. Um, we really value your partnership. So you know, please just don't hesitate to, you know, reach out if um, anything ever comes up. We do. Thank you, Summer. We, we, are, we are a team, all of us. 
Um, our goals are the same to um, educate social workers and um, we value you and thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's a, for those of you who are just starting to do this, it is um, an unbelievable, it's, it's, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes attention, but it's also an unbelievably wonderful, rewarding experience.